Hi, welcome to Go on the Run. And today we're going to look at how to use our protobuffer skills to encode and decode messages. So far, all we've been doing is learn about what protobuffer is, how to write messages, the syntax, that sort of thing. But we haven't really used it to write any messages, like to encode a message and compare the size of that encoded message to any other way, the other ways that we know how to encode a message, right? Remember, we already know how to encode messages as XML. We know how to encode them as JSON. Or we know how to encode them in Go binary, uh, which is that GUB package. And we have already tested the size and checked and compared the size of messages encoded with XML, JSON to our GUB binary and we saw that XML was three times the size of JSON and GUB was even a little bit smaller than um, JSON, but we said that our GUB is a specifically like a Golang thing. But XML and JSON, those are interchangeable. And the reason we're looking at protocol buffer is because eventually we want to get to gRPC, but protocol buffers on their own, just looking at it as a format for encode and decode in messages, the promise is that it's language neutral. And so that's nice, but if it's going to be bigger or less efficient, well, does it matter that it's language neutral? XML is language neutral, but it's worse than JSON. So with that said, let's jump in and take a look at how we use our new phone protobuf for skills. Let me go to our source directory. And so as we know, we're working on section 22, binary encoding, and we finish it part one, two, and three. And two and three is when we're learning about protocol buffers. Um, part one is when we use Go binary package to encode messages and compare it with what we know from XML and JSON. Let me open up my Visual Studio Code editor here, and let's see what we've done. So we know that in part three, section exercise five, we ended after we have learned how to create messages and we saw that how oh, we can use enum and that sort of thing. So that's great. Well, like I said, part two and three was learning about protocol buffers. But part one is where we sort of left off when we were able, when we had a client and a server and for our client and server, let's see what format messages we we're using. So we had, here's our client, it's submitting messages and it's using this GUP format. Okay, great. So I think we should be able to pick up from here. We should copy this as our starting point. Now, the other thing I wanna do is if you look at exercise one or exercise one here, what we did was we start off with what is the message we wanna encode and we just sort of played with it a little bit to see that we can encode this message. And then in part two, we encode it as XML and then part three as JSON. So I think what we really want to do is sort of reset and start with one and four. So I'll click copy these, select them, and I'll right click and I'll say copy. Then I'll close this up and I'll right click here and say part four. So this is what we're gonna be working on. I'll close this. And then on the part four directory, I'll right click and I'll say paste. And so in this directory, I should expect to see exercise one and four. Remember exercise one is this very simple exercise where we have just the message that we want to work with and we will be defined that message. And then we have the simple Go application where we test our message. In exercise four, we sort of work our way to using the GUB package. We will modify this instead to use protocol buffers, but we're not there yet. What I, why I want to start with our simple message is I want us to turn this into a protocol buffer message instead of us writing it, write a proto file and after proto buffer generate the messages that we'll use. So how do we do this? Well, I would say first things first is let's just rename this file to a proto file. Cause remember, we're not gonna want this file anyway. And from the protocol doc buffer documentation, it says you should use snake case with file name. So we'll use snake case there. 
we could kind of call it client request that portal um, but maybe our server will eventually want to respond so maybe we should just call it messages just call it messages for now and now let's focus on this proto message well i'll close this side panel for now because we don't really need to see um, the files there so let's focus on our protocol message well we know that one of the first things we have to do when we write a proto buffer um, file is we have to see what syntax we're using so here we should say because otherwise that is assume um proto buffer 2 so we should say um uh, proto 3 that's the syntax and we have this package is a um, keyword but everything ends in semicolon and we can call, say that our package is model we also have the option of using a different um, package much different package name here and then the option the go option to specify something else so for now since we've been using model as our name let's keep it that way so proto buffer does not have this idea of constants, but it does have enums. And this is how we're using these constants anyway. Each one of these, when we use IOTA, it increments the value. So it starts with, let's say, one, two, three, four, and that's what IOTA is doing automatically for us. And so since we have enums, why don't we turn this into an enum? Because that's what we really want. And because Go doesn't have enum, well, we have to use cons. So according to the enum, um, to the proto buffer specification, when you have an enum, the first value must be zero. And the reason for this is that, so when you create a message that uses an enum as a field, that zero value can be specified. And so should add be or zero value? But I don't think so, because I don't want a default message to be an add message. Instead, I will say invalid is our default message the one with zero and so if you're not sure what i'm talking about if you go to a pro buffer website click on guides then click on pro buffer three and then look at enum and then scroll down here you see it says the, there must be a zero value so that when we use a zero as a numeric default and then the zero value needs to be the first element so there you go and so in mine, I will use invalid as the default value, just in case somebody doesn't set it explicitly. So, okay, so that looks good. So we kind of took care of that. Um, we were using a request size and we had this constant defined for the maximum size of our message, which was this here. We had a slice that is represented by this size and it was always the size, but we can say how big the message is that we're sending. And so we didn't always use the full size, but this was just the max size. And then we can say, well, for this message, like you, you can imagine if we send a request for some random numbers, for example, to say, send back some random numbers, um, we might just specify um, a value, you know, encode the value 10. And so that might only requires two bytes if we use 16 bits or four bytes if we use int or just one byte if we use or just a byte value because it's just 10 the number 10 and so we really didn't need all of this so we actually when we're using pro power buffer we don't have this idea of a constant so for now i'll comment this so we can see how we can get rid of this later now here we have this type and so pro power buffer doesn't have this Now, protocol buffer doesn't have unsigned int, but rather unsigned int 32 and unsigned int 64. Since these are messages, and I imagine that, you know, my client might run for, and server might run for a very long time, I'll say maybe we can do int 32 or int 64. So I'll do u int 64 as my message ID. It is unique ID for each message. And so the request type, and before we were using an int for a request type, but we don't need to do that anymore because we actually have a request type as a field and we can simply say that oh this is the type of the request which is we can say type as a field now 
let's jump down to this guy. Now, do we really need to specify the size? Well, we cannot use an array like this anyway. So if we go back and we start looking at what's available, so we scroll up in this list to see all the scalar types, we'll see that oh, we have double, float, int32, a bunch of integer types, but none of them are 8-bit values. We have Boolean, we have strings, and then we have bytes. And so if you look, you see byte contains multiple bytes, and it can be no longer than 2 to the 32. So that's pretty big. And so in Go, that would just be a slice of byte, which is exactly what we were using anyway. So that tells me that all we really need to say is that we have bytes. We don't need to specify this and this encodes the size of it so we never have to worry no matter how many bytes we use so long as less than 2 to the 32 which is a pretty big message um, or a field we don't have to worry about it and since the size is included or you know inferred from the data then we don't need to actually specify a size and because we can go to messages that are, are a field size that's much larger than what we were planning to use anyway. We can do this and simply enforce whatever size that we want on this field somewhere else in our code. Now we could have moved that constants to a common package that both the client and server uses to validate that all um, byte size doesn't isn't too big, but that's a different thing. That's beyond the scope of defining our message, right? And so in terms of this, I think we have everything we need. So if we save and we reformat our message, it sort of looked like this, and this looks okay. Now, some of you might be wondering, why didn't we use repeated like this? Well, since bytes is already, um, you know, multiple values or, you know, a, a sequence of something, we don't need to repeat it bytes, right? Like if it was string or something, that we could do repeated string. All right. So... Um, so I think this is fine. So now we're done with our message. Um, the next thing we need to do is to compile it. So let's sort of open up here and we're already at the prompt. And so what we can do is say, well, okay, this is our directory and let's just go to part four, do ls. Oh, it's good. Let's exercise one also, ls. And so we can do proto c. Remember that's our protocol compiler, proto buffer compiler. Do minus i to say I want to include a certain directory for you to look for proto messages, and that's in case, like I said in the last video, protocol buffer allows you to do include messages, so auto proto messages you might define in another file, so you don't have to put everything in one file. And what we want to do is generate stuff for Go, so we can do go that out, and the path where I want to generate this is back in my models directory. And since I'm using minus i to tell Proto Compiler that it can search in this directory, now I just need to specify the file name. So I don't actually have to specify the entire path. So messages.proto. And if I run that, you can see, of course, it generated this Go file back in this directory. Now we've examined this already and we saw that oh, there's nothing terribly fancy. Here is that const like we have defined it before, except it doesn't use iota. Again, this is what we wanted. And further down, we find that we have our um, our types. So, okay, so we don't have to worry about looking into those either. This is our client request type. We don't have a response type right now. And so those are our three fields, and we know these other fields we can ignore. So for now, we'll, we'll just leave this there as something interesting, and we can close this. Now, if we jump over to our main, we don't want to use GOP to encode a message necessarily. Um, what we want to do is try and see how we can encode a message using protobuf. And so for that, we actually need the protobuf library. Now, where do we get that? Well, it's right here. So I, I'll just cheat by copying this and then going back to my main code and I'll say import, call it proto and when you go to import a protobuf message, notice with XML, JSON, and GoBot and Gob, you create a new encoder. With protobuf, you don't need to do that. You simply take your message, whatever it is, after you done initialize your message, and you say proto that marshal. So 
So I don't need bytes that buffer anymore. I can do this. Return exit our program. And so here, however, how big is that message? Well, since it's a slice of byte, we can simply use, so we can use length function and we're good. So now this is how we get the length. So now that we have the length, we can run our code program and see. So first thing I would think we should do is go into our models directory and do go build or rather install to install our models package. And we go back up and we can do go run main. And let's see, oh, request type and request size. Well, makes sense. Let me close this. We no longer has the field, the, the field size because we don't need to do that. And request type, well, we, I think we just call it type. So type three, for example, but you know, we can easily said, call that on our model. So let's do it this way. Okay, so that's it, right? So that's add operation. And if we wanted to specify some data, well, we can do message that, and there was a data field. So remember slices carry their capacity and length with them. Okay, so that's my message to the server and maybe the server is gonna parse it and send it back. And so now, if I go back here and run my code, you can see buffer size is 11. Okay, so that's great. So we've successfully encoded a message in protocol buffer and that tells us that's 11. What does that really mean? Is that better than what we're doing? All we've done is say, show that how we can use protocol buffers to encode messages. We haven't tried to decode it. We haven't compared it with anything else. So let's do just that. So let's close this. And this is exercise one. So I'll copy exercise one. I'll paste it back on my directory there. And this is now exercise two. And in exercise two, let's do some comparison. So we have our model, we're not gonna change that. And so what we can do is main, we can, let's do close this for now. And let's just say that if this is our message that we've created, we want to compare it with a number of different things. So this prints it out as in proto buffer, so encode it and check it. So why not just call this a function that does test proto and or proto buff and give it this message, message to server. This should work. I haven't really done anything other than move things around. And so let's retest just to make sure that we haven't broken anything. So I'm open my terminal, I'm back in the same place, but I'm in exercise one. So I need to go up and go into exercise two. And then if I do go run, I should see that oh, nothing changed. And that's good. All right, let's give ourselves, maybe I can close, reduce the size here a little bit. Maybe this is probably too big. Okay, so now that I have this example in protobuf, why not just compare it? And so let me make a example that uses gob. We have already seen the gob thing, but we want to compare the size to gob. Message size, and this we can say is protobuf message size. And so let's test our gob encoding. And so now if I rerun this, I should see two outputs and we should see, wow, that is a huge difference. Um, is this really the case that the gob message is 155 bytes and the proto buffer one is only 11 bytes? I don't know. We'll have to see when we decode that what we're sending, we can read back. So that's going to be interesting. Okay. So. The other thing we should do is while we are at it is why not compare the other ones also. And so we have some expectations. So for this is, let's call this one JSON. This is XML, XML. And if we save, 
that should be enough. We should re import encoding that JSON and XML, and that's all there is to it. And what we should expect is XML should be the worst. Um, oh, we have to call them, of course. JSON, this is the order in which we actually learn to encode stuff. We did JSON, XML first, JSON, then gob, no protobuffer. So let's clean up our screen a little bit and let's rerun our code. And you can see um, our XML message is 179 bytes. Uh, JSON is 36 and gob is 153. This is a little bit surprising because what we saw was gob binary encoding was smaller than JSON. And so for some odd reason, our gob package right now, the encoding size is larger than JSON. So but let's see if these things we can read back. So let's do that. And so I'll go here, copy exercise two, and then I'll paste it back in part four. And so that should give us some crazy name like exercise two copy. Um, so exercise three. I prefer the other way in which um, Visual Studio Code used to name things, maybe because I'm lazy, but oh well, people complain and they didn't like it. So let's close this and let's look at a new example. And so what we should do with our test is that if we encode something, we should also decode it. So it's good that we can encode it and that's the size of it. Let's decode it. So let's call message in. We're going to pretend this is a message that we are going to receive. So we're going to read this message from, you know, buffer. So message in is model that client request. And so we want a pointer to a message. Now we can just do a value and then get the pointer later, but why not do it this way? So we get the pointer to an actual message somewhere in the heap and or somewhere. And so now we want to decode it. So we can say decoder. So this is protobuf actually. So to, in protobuf, just like how we marshal this way by just simply saying proto.marshal, you can unmarshal a message by just simply saying proto.unmarshal. So proto that unmarshal this message. Okay. And so we can test and see if we have an error. Otherwise, I can just print out whatever was decoded and then length of MSG that data that data okay so how many bytes are we storing in here okay so we know that we're dealing with the same size messages and we pass the same message to all our different functions so now that we have this there let's just copy this put it in gob tests and the difference is instead of on marshall we need a decoder and so we print out the size and so on and since i've done all this work from here i'll copy this because this is most similar to what we'll need to do for the other guys so instead of doing gob we'll do here json change this to json and JSON decoder. Similarly, enter here, paste, and I need to do a XML decoder, and I just simply say XML. All right, so let's go up to exercise three, and we're going to clear our screen. It's kind of a little bit messy. Let's give ourselves some space here, and then we'll do the whole go run thing. And there we go. So the message size is five. And so when we encode with XML, 179 bytes, we get back the same ID. We get back the same type of message that we send in, which is add. And we see that we get back five. JSON, same thing. We get back the message that we sent. Um, gob, same thing. So we always get back the message we, we encode, but gob is using 153 bytes in this case. Um, but we have seen before that oh, there are other times when GOP come in significantly less, well, slightly less, not significantly less than JSON. My feeling it has to do with maybe the buffer size. So GOP is encoding for our 
byte that are um, for data that the actual length of the buffer and so on. So it's sending a little bit more data, whereas the length and the capacity of that um, slice, whereas for JSON, it's simply sending the data as an array only. So um, that might be the case where in for this short message, it's coming out that oh, it's using more. And since it's using um, length and capacity might be four bytes or eight bytes, it's end up adding up significantly. So that's just my guess. I don't know the detail of Gob encoding, but what we valid want to validate is that for ProBuff, we can encode, decode, and we're using the least amount of bytes. So even in the best case here, when we have JSON that's really small at 36 bytes, look at our proto buffer message. It's one third of that size. So definitely this, we can use this to validate to our friends and colleagues that, you know, we should go to proto buffer if we can use it, especially if we can we have control of the client and the server. Okay. So that validates that. Now in exercise four, like I said, what we copied from before, we, Let's close this out. What we're doing is we had our client message, this guy, and uh, let's close this also. So let's clean this up. Um, we can delete this one. And we we specify our message, and then our clients were used. You know, were generating creating messages and the submit and sending it to our server, and our server was decoding those messages and telling us it would run for about 10 seconds. We implemented our server to run for 10 seconds, listen to as many messages as it could, and then just print out how many messages it was able to receive in that time. So notice this server is using gob. Let's convert this to using uh, protobuf. So the first thing I wanna do is, uh, let's do this. I wanna get rid of this guy. Um, because we're no longer using this. Let's get rid of this. And from my exercise three, I'll just copy that model, which is these two files. I'll keep these two files together. So I press copy on my keyboard. So I'll just go here, paste it. And should I expect see those messages? Okay, great. All right, they're there. For my client is the easiest one. I'll update first. In client, we're using, we're in the same model says so the model package from our binary encoding module so and that's what's defined here module is binary encoding so that's good and what do we need to change well still want to try and send try and send a hundred thousand messages none of this stuff change none of this stuff change here we were setting the size for our message because we didn't really had a size we were just putting setting a size value and because of how our client request was defined, it was always a slice of 1K bytes. Whereas now, this, our data size can flex. And so what we can do, we don't have this anymore. What we can do is say that oh, we have request that data. And let's, to keep things fair, this was just a field anyway. We'll just say, make a buffer of, uh, bytes 10 24 anyway just like we had before and so now that we have our message we can call this encode request and this function just simply use the gob encoder to encode it but now we want to switch from using gob to using protobuf so once again i will instead grab the package for proto buffer go back here paste it up here because that's what we're using scroll down and buffer well remember what we said if you're using proto buff you do proto at marshall and then you give it your message which is this request message it returns byte and error message so let's call it bytes and some error and then we'll check our error well, this buffer is going to be an empty buffer. So basically we have nothing to send. On the server side here, we're using gob to decode. Well, again, I'm going to go here, paste this and say that let's use that instead to decode. And 
here instead of creating a new decoder we don't need to create a new decoder but we have this r that body and r that body is the request body and that contains our message so r that body is a read closer so which means you can read from it so what we can do is use something like io util that read all and so that reads all the bytes from a reader like our body and it returns it in terms of bytes and an error if there was an error and so we can say check if there's an error if there's an error then we just simply return we have nothing else to do otherwise what we might want to do is i see we have a defer close here and i'll get back to this but for now let's move this defer close up above here somewhere for example and so yep if there's nothing nothing we can return and of course that closes the body because we have it below here just now so that would never get to the default close if we can read the data from the request which is what the client sent then we should try and unmarshal it remember with proto buffer we unmarshal we don't decode so we proto that unmarshal and we unmarshal some bytes into a message and so the message we want to marshal it into is this message that we can get from our resource pool and so we don't need this decode because we just do one marshal that's it okay so if i save this it should import io utils and it should get rid of gob encoding that gob or gob or whatever that was called so no issues so let's compile and run this so I'll again open up my terminal at the bottom here and with that I want to go to part four. I want to go to exercise four and let's do this. I'll split my terminal because I need a server and a client. So let's CD to server and I'll go go build. See if that builds. Oh, so declare define but not use. So I'll use click there control click and so is declare uh, this is supposed to be on Marshall supposed to be an error and there's no new error value so let me pull this down just to no new error value so let's see um, let's do this let's print out log that error and say unable to read message from client and then we will specify what our message is. And similarly, if we can't decode it, I'll move this down here and to there and say, unable to decode proto message, proto buff message. All right, um, so this is redundant because there's just some Marshall in the message. Okay, so that's that. Uh, let's see if we can build now. All right, build successfully. On this side, we'll go to the client directory and we'll say go that build. Ah, so what is the problem now? Ah, so on the client side, let's command click this. What we're doing is we're incrementing, for each message we increment and send a new message ID. But our variable here is on sign int, but protobuf doesn't have that, so it was on sign 64 that was created for our message instead. So if we go back here and we go look at the field type for ID, it's on sign 64. So that's all we needed to do. And so let's try and rebuild this. There we go. So let's clean up. And so we have a client. And what we want is we know our server is going to run for 10 seconds. So let's start our client. It's going to fail. But that's okay, because since it's already running, well, what's going on? Control C. So since it's already running, when the server comes up, 
it's just going to start receiving message. So that's the most accurate way to do it is to have the client client just be ready and sending messages. And then the server, once it, once it come online, it starts receiving messages. It's going to run for 10 seconds. And so we'll know how many messages that server receive in 10 seconds. I suppose if we start up the server, the 10 seconds are already clock is already running down. And so by the time we go over to the client and start it up, you know, uh, we are always going to have some weird things. So that's not going to be the most straightforward way. So, okay. So what is the problem here? Well, let's scroll back up and see. So it says unable to read message, HHP invalid read on closed body. That's a really interesting message because the, we're getting that from the HTTP server. And so uh, HTTP package, and if, and it has to do specifically with this, we defer close. Well, but we, if we defer close, we actually didn't call a close. This message is coming from here when we actually try to read um, the message. So it says unable to read message from client. So this is coming from here when we try to do that first read when our handler is called. And so to understand what's going on and what's confusing is, I'll show you what's confusing later, but anyway, so let's go here. And if you read this, you will see it says body is the request body. For the client request, a nil body means the request has no bodies, such as a get request or whatever. But we're the server. For the server request, the request body is always not non-nil, but will return an EOF immediately when no body is present. The client will close the request body. The server HTTP handler does not need to do this, right? So I don't know how I missed that the first time when I did this, but we don't need to do close. Okay, so that goes away, but that still doesn't take away our error. We can compile this and rerun it and see. So let's do just that. So I'll do go build and let's prepare our server for running. And I go back here and I'll run the client. Like I said, it's going to keep running. Server come online and it's the exact same thing. So I'm going to stop the client because the client is sending these messages. Server is going to finish in 10 seconds anyway. So that is still a problem. So what is really happening? And so if you think about what we're doing, we call this HTTP server handler. And because of what the message says just now, it says that the HTTP server handler doesn't need to explicitly close. But this function, when it returns, it closes the body. And so when we kick off this go routine, before this go routine can run, well, the function go, the, this function returns but maybe our function here doesn't get started yet. And so what happened is it's off. Let's see, let's pull this down so you can see what's going on. So imagine that uh, when we call go, this goes off and schedule this function as create this function as a go routine to run and returns. When it returns, this function returns. So at that point it says, oh, I, I, this call returns so I can call close on the request body here. But when it call close on the request body, now our function is trying to go read that request body. And guess what? It's already closed. And that's why we see in this message that says HTTP invalid read on already closed body. So we have a race condition. That's what we have happening. So what we really want to do, we can just read the data. Then before we return, knowing that how the body will be closed, then we pass that data off to be processed. So at this point, we would have already read the data. So if I bring this down here, what happened is I read the body, but because this didn't return, I'm not going to get this, you know, already closed body. I read the bytes from it, and then I go into this go routine to say process it. So I can allocate a message. I can unmarshal it and all that stuff because the data has already safely been read from the body already. So this all this process in time, how long my um, resource pool takes and all this other stuff is handled in this go routine. And so even if this takes a very long time to spin up or anything, by the time I return, this body is free to close. We already have the data in B. So let's just, with that simple change, let's now re go back and build our, so go build and see if we'll still get the same message. So server that's ready client i'm gonna kick out the client then come over here kick out the server and notice that error message went away 
because we had a race condition before. Now, when you use the other encoders, you'll say, well, this look like um, with the same code. And why did the other encoder have the other message? Well, it's a race condition. Somehow the code path that was taken, it didn't result in that error message. Maybe they were faster to get to reading the body, whatever it is, but this is the correct way to implement it. So again, reading the documentation for body, for the server, you don't need to explicitly close it. It's closed when it's returned. And that's proven by the fact that when we had that race condition, it tells you that, oh, that the body was already closed, which means it is closing it. Now, if you look here, our client is still going, that's fine, it's trying to send 100,000 messages, we don't care. Our server um, was able in the 10 seconds to process 60 something thousand messages. And this is used in um, protobuf. So let's run it again. So let's prep our server, get our client going. Client send 100,000 messages, server you, you process for 10 seconds. Let's see how many messages you can do. Remember, if you want to profile stuff, you have to do a lot more than this. You have to do it more often. You don't know what else I have going on on my computer. I don't know what I have going on on my computer, but this seems to be coming in at the 60 something thousand messages. Okay, there are two ways to look at this. Can I process more messages within the same time? That's a plus. Or are my messages smaller? Well, we already proved the, first, the second point. We checked already the messages are absolutely smaller. So that's a plus in itself. And the other way to look at it is if I give in the same amount of time, how many more messages can I process? So I think for us to wrap this up now that we've demonstrated that we can use protobuf to not only define our messages, but um, encode them and decode them. So what I can go back here and do is copy this. This is the one the implementation with gob. I'll copy it and I'll paste it here. And we'll call this exercise five. So it's supposed to be four copy. And so let's call it five gob, just so we kind of know what we're doing. And so what I want to do with this example is modify it is that we fix that race condition in the example that we had there. And so what I'll do is I'll say, let's close the client because we don't have to modify the client nor this. And so, oh, well, actually we want our gob implementation to use, yep, these messages that was generated by protobuf, which we know are the same, but it still doesn't matter. Let's go over here and make sure that our, our gob example is using the same messages that were generated by protobuf. So we'll say paste and we'll get rid of this client request that go message. All right, so let's close this up. And what we want to do is compare this server. So we do select for compare, select for compare. Where is that? Select for compare. And we want to select, compare it to our gob server. So we go here, come on, select for compare, Com se compare with selected rather. And then now let me close this for a little bit. So on the left hand side is our exercise four server, which is the one using protobuf. We can see that here. And then on the right hand side is the one using gob. And so what I'm looking for, or what is it that I want to do is make sure that my implementation is sort of similar. And so here, like I said, we immediately started kick off that go routine, but we, and we even closed the, 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 body and we didn't need to as we saw from the documentation so we don't need to do this so we should take that out um, the other thing we should do is bring this down so that we don't have a race condition to after we read from the body so this needs to be like here for example so let's save it and so the first thing we do uh, let's do that the first thing we do is read from that body, but here we create a binary encoder. Now, when we create a decoder, let me binary de encoder, a decoder, that only says how we can read from this body, but it actually haven't read the message yet. To keep things fair so that we still keep in this function the, you know, allocating and processing a message, what we should do is read all this data out into a, um, the same thing like here. So we should do something like this. So we should do absolutely do this, right? 
read all the bytes out and then put the encoding bits in here. So however we encode and decode is not, you know, it's, uh, let's say, sorry, uh, let's go. I'll, I'll show you this um, again. So when it makes sense. Okay. So I just want to compare it to get it pretty much the same. So what are we doing? We're going to make sure we read all the bytes out in both cases. So in both of my examples, I read the bytes out before I return. And so now the only work I'm doing inside the Go routine is whatever work it needs to allocate a message to receive that, um, that data, the message, um, allocate a variable to receive that data, that message and decode the message, not from our body, but rather this is going to be from our, um, so we need a buff rather. So we're going to say bytes that um, new buffer and we'll initialize it with B. Okay. So save this. Let me close this and we'll go back and just study the function that I just wrote. So let's go back here. I'll close this guy and let's look at this. So this is the one that's using gob. And so what I want to do is fix that race condition that we never got an error from, but we know is a race condition after we read the Golang documentation for how we should use our body. We shouldn't explicitly try to close it and it's closed when we return. So since it's closed when we return, we must make sure that we read from it before we return. And we can go into the Go routine. Now our Go routine is free to go allocate a place to store the message that we're going to decode. And then it wants to decode it using Gob Decoder. But Gob Decoder needs an I.O. reader. How do we get an I.O. reader? Well, we only have bytes. Well, we create a new I.O. reader by creating a buffer. So now that we have this, let's now, we can keep this open because we want to compare this with our um, proto buffer server is trying to do about 67. Now, again, we already know protobuffer is better in terms of the size. This other part about how many messages you can encode and decode is just icing it on top because if you have smaller messages, chances are you spend less time encoding them, which means you can get to the second message faster. You spend less time decoding it, which means you can get to that second message. So that's how you end up doing or should do and um, should be able to encode more messages. But let's see. So here we are about six something thousand. Let's see what we can do. So here I'll open my thing. And we're doing part four and we're doing exercise five, which is the gob one. And so I'll open up two prompts here. I'll call this one my client. I'll do go bill just to make sure I have the most recent bill. And as we can see that there's that size thing again that we have to fix because we're using a different package. So let me close exercise four. Size. We don't actually use size, but rather we want to make all messages the same. So data is equals to make slice of byte. That's 10, 24. That's going to be the same size that we were testing with for our protobuf. So, all right, let's see if we can rebuild that. And successes. All right. So then, so we want to compare, compare apples to apples. So both clients are sending the same size messages. And then for a server, let's do go build. And I don't expect this to fail and it didn't. So server ready. Let's get our client running. And we know that if this is sending messages and then this come online for 10 seconds, just how many messages can process. And there we go. 50 something thousand messages. Our client is still going because a hundred thousand messages, but so far 10,000 more messages with protobuf. Let's just run that again. So our server is, is our server is ready. Client start sending messages. Server, see how many you can accept in 10 seconds. And this is server and client doing the same work. The only thing that's different um, between them is the encoding format. All right. And again, coming about 50 something thousand. But this seems consistent only in the fact that I did twice. But you can, if you have to really do this for work or something, sure, you might, you have to 
find better ways, but it looks like if, and that's consistent with the fact that our, our message is smaller. Okay, so that's it. Um, this is already pretty long, but see you in the next um, video where we're gonna move on. So let's see what we're we doing. So here we are in, so let's go back up. Auto part four, and we're in binary encoding. I think we have covered everything in binary encoding. We looked at binary encoding with GUB, that was in part one, and we compared it to why it's better than the text encoding. And then we ended with proto buffer encoding. Now, if we look at what we have, that's binary encoding, we just finished that. And so the next thing is looking at gRPC. And gRPC, we can use protobuf knowledge to define um, servers. So gRPC is just, gRPC is a remote procedure call. But we'll get into that in the next video. Start looking at gRPC. All right, take care. See you later. Bye.